What we do is start with a fluid bolus because a lot of the times the hypotension during anesthesia is related to the vasodilation associated with the use of inhalant anesthetics, right? They cause a lot of vasodilation. Um, so I go ahead and give that fluid bolus and I usually use 10 to 20 mils per kilo over 15 minutes. And this basically comes from the numbers of shock rate fluids. Shock rate fluids in a cat is 60 mil, or 60 mil per kilo per hour and in a dog it's 90 mil per kilo per hour. So you're basically giving shock rate fluids for 15 minutes. Um, a lot of times that will bring up the pressures or help bring up the pressures. Um, I would say that in most healthy patients, they'll tolerate two or three fluid boluses um, safely. I would say if you're getting to the point where you're giving two or three fluid boluses, you probably need to move on to some inotropic therapy, which I'm going to talk about next. Um, but be cautious in patients with congestive heart failure. They're not going to tolerate that fluid. All right, and so there are certain patients we have to be cautious with. Also, patients with oliguric renal disease. So oliguric renal disease means they cannot produce urine. You probably aren't anesthetizing any of those patients because they have a very, very bad prognosis. Pulmonary disease would be another one because when you have uh, pulmonary inflammation, the vasculature gets leaky, and you can see more um, evidence, or you, you, it's more easily you can more easily create pulmonary edema. So be aware of pulmonary disease, coagulopathies, vasculitis, head trauma, intracranial tumors, hypoproteinemia, and anemia are other things that you kind of keep in the back of your mind that they may not tolerate high volumes of fluids, okay? So just bear in mind those factors. And if those don't work, then we go to dopamine. And I don't know, do, do any of you use dopamine routinely in your practices? few people. Yeah, dopamine, is a, it's a great drug, and once you're comfortable with it, it's super easy to use. But there is a little bit of a comfort level associated with using this drug. This is a vasoactive drug, and you can see some really negative side effects with it. You can cause a lot of hypertension, tachycardia if you give bolus doses. Um, I remember I had a tech one time who gave a bolus dose of dopamine to an awake cat, and the cat poof, fell over. It was his own cat. Um, but uh, yeah, the cat, he, it was a mistake. Basically, he flushed the IV line um, and bolused it in, and the cat just kind of, it just went really tachycardic and fell down and was kind of, but it, it, it lived. It wasn't a big deal. You're unlikely to kill the patient by doing it, but try not to. So, dopamine is a drug that we use quite commonly, and we usually start it at about seven microgram per kilo per minute. Um, and the way we do it is we deliver it with a syringe driver. And it is a drug that you do have to deliver as a CRI. So it has, it's a constant rate infusion of the drug. So you do need to give it with a syringe driver or mix it into your fluids or something. But you have to be very careful. When you plug this drug in, because it's a vasoactive drug, I always recommend it's cl plugged into the closest port to the vein. Because if you plug it in up your IV line, you know, 15 feet up your IV line, and now you change the, the rate of your primary fluids, all that... Dopamine that's sitting in your line is going to get flushed into your patient, which can lead to the tachycardia and hypertension that can be associated with that drug. So it's a great drug to use. It works really well. Um, we probably have to use it so much because we, use, we do a lot of epidurals in our patients, which causes a lot of vasodilation um, at the hind end. And so we do actually find that we do have a, a lot of our patients will end up getting dopamine at some point. Um, we also deal with a lot of really you know, sick animals that tend to need dopamine as well. But in your routine practice, you probably don't need dopamine that often, but it's sort of the end thing that you'd use. Dobutamine and ephedrine, I'm not going to really talk about. Dobutamine is a, a drug similar to dopamine. And I guess I should say a couple things about dopamine. Um, the other thing about dopamine is we use it to increase contractility. That's really what I'm trying to do is increase contractility, the strength with which that pump is pumping, and have a bigger stroke volume, and I'll have better blood pressures. Just keep in mind that at low doses, you can actually see some vasodilation associated with it, and you may actually get some hypotension. And then at very high doses, we cause vasoconstriction, which isn't really the way I want to manage blood pressure. It's not usually by causing vasoconstriction, but there are patients where I will have to go up um, fairly high. And there's also a lot of variability in the dose of dopamine that each patient requires. In human ICU patients, there's up to a 20 times difference um, in the doses required to increase renal perfusion. So this drug is very individual to the patient and we individualize it to our patients. And we usually tend to start at five to seven micrograms per kilo per minute and then go up or down from there, okay? Um, dobutamine is a similar drug in that it increases myocardial contractility, but it also decreases uh, systemic vascular resistance. So it'll increase cardiac output, but it doesn't increase blood pressure. And I'm not talking about it much because it doesn't really do what we want it to do in dogs and cats, which is increase blood pressure. It'll definitely increase your cardiac output. In horses is where we use that drug. And ephedrine is a drug where we can give it as a bolus. It's sort of like, I call it weak epinephrine, and it tends to last a little bit longer, so it'll bring up blood pressure and heart rate and so forth too. All right, bradycardia, um, so that's all I want to say about blood pressure. Is that pretty clear as mud? Yeah, that's what I thought. Um, 
But you guys are welcome to call us too and just go over it. And we have some stuff written on it. And I can send it to you as well. Just to kind of these are the steps you go through to treat um, hypotension. And we do it all the same at Canada West. Pretty much every all the technicians go through this little checklist on each single patient that they are anesthetizing. Um, if they become hypotensive. Bradycardia, I've already told you what the parameters are for bradycardia, and I've already told you why we would treat bradycardia, because it's associated with reduced cardiac output and blood pressure. The other reason sometimes bradycardia you end up treating is because it interferes with your automated monitoring systems, um, especially if you have a pronounced sinus arrhythmia in association with that. So things like non-invasive blood pressure monitoring don't work very well in really in patients that have really odd rhythms or they have a real sinus arrhythmia associated with it. So again, that's another lecture, but uh, it would be interesting to talk about it. Um, the reason that we probably get the bradycardia during anesthesia is because we have a relative or absolute increase in parasympathetic tone um, relative to sympathetic tone. So basically, if you look at your heart rate, for most intents and purposes, it's controlled by sympathetic tone and parasympathetic tone. Parasympathetic tone tends to bring down your heart rate. Sympathetic tone tends to bring up your heart rate. But when we anesthetize patients, what do we do to sympathetic tone? It goes down, right, because now the patient's asleep. So parasympathetic tone can predominate, and that's sometimes why we'll see a bradycardia. Contrary to popular belief, as you deepen a patient under anesthesia, heart rate does not go down consi like consistently. A lot of people feel like well, as they get too deep, the heart rate comes down. That's not necessarily the case for the heart rate being low. Anesthesia in general, just decreasing sympathetic tone, will allow the animal to be in a state where it's more likely to develop a bradycardia, okay? But as you continue to deepen anesthesia, the heart rate doesn't continue to drop. It's not a linear fashion, all right? Um, so there's lots of other things, too. We do give opioids. Opioids do increase vagal tone, so increase parasympathetic tone, which can lead to a bradycardia. Um, we can also get reflex bradycardias associated with things like intubation, although it's very rare. I think I've seen it once in my entire life, um, a bradycardia associated with int intubation. You can get it from the oculocardiac reflex. You can do it through uh, manipulation of the jugulars and just rubbing on them or holding them off. Um, sometimes you can get this visceral traction, very rare again to see it. But if you have it happening, it's easy to treat. Other causes um, would be things like hypothermia, hyperkalemia, or a true cardiac conduction abnormality. Um, and these hypothermia and hyperkalemia are very, very poorly responsive to anticholinergic therapy. In other words, you give them an anticholinergic atropine or glycopyrrolate, the heart rate doesn't change. And I could tell you another great story about a hyperkalemic patient with a resident, but, um, but it's not relevant really to this conversation, other than to say that that's where I learned that, yes, anticholinergics don't work for or bradycardia associated with hyperkalemia. Um, first question I always ask is, does it require treatment? So even if I have a dog with a heart rate of 60, which I might consider low, if the blood pressure on that dog is awesome, then I don't treat it. I just leave it and ride it out. I'll usually say to the tech, make sure you have a dose ready just in case, but you don't have to treat it if the blood pressure is normal. Um, first thing you should try and do is identify the cause um, and address that, and then consider treating with an anticholinergic. And I don't really care whether you use atropine or glycopyrrolate. Some people get really anxious about using one over the other. I prefer glycopyrrolate just because I tend to get less, um, a less dramatic response. So instead of the heart rate going from 60 to you know, 180, it'll go from 60 to 100. So I like glycopyrrolate. One of the side effects, though, that you can see with uh, treatment with an anticholinergic is sometimes you'll get a second-degree heart block after you treat with your anticholinergic, which is very disconcerting because here you've got a dog with a heart rate of 50. Now all of a sudden you give it a dose of anticholinergic, and now the heart rate is 50, but now you've got a secondary heart block occurring as well. Um, usually that goes away on its own, and if it does occur, just give them another dose, and it'll, it'll fix it. Okay? Um, and again, there's some theories as to why that happens, um, but treating it again with another dose of anticholinergic will usually solve the problem. So don't be surprised if that happens. Tachycardia is another problem that we see, and it's hard to define exactly what tachycardia is. And tachycardia is rarely that clinically significant in my patients during anesthesia. Um, usually I recognize that it's there. Um, I know that it can increase myocardial work and oxygen consumption, could lead to myocardial oxygen deficits. Um, however, having said that, our patients are not prone to arterial sclerosis like humans are. For example, in human anesthesia, tachycardia is a very, very bad thing. They do not like us to become tachycardic. Whereas in veterinary anesthesia, it's not as big a deal because we're not prone to clotting and, and developing these myocardial ischemic events. Um, it can decrease your stroke volume and your cardiac output. So there is. So you remember I said heart rate can increase your cardiac output and your blood pressure and everything? Well, there does come to a point where heart rate gets so high 
that your systemic or your stroke volume de starts to decrease and you don't actually get a net benefit anymore. And so um, it can lead to insufficient time for ventricular filling and may interfere with your blood pressure. Um, it can interfere with your automated monitoring systems as well. Um, but that's, you know, it's rare for that to happen unless you have arrhythmias. So first thing I do with tachycardia is I just go through the list of differentials for causes, and these are probably the most common causes. So the first thing, and again, the techs have to know this list and tell me what is it that could cause it, and they have to rule them out. So hypovolemia, well, the patient was well hydrated, already gave it one or two fluid boluses, okay, it's probably not hypovolemic. Is it inadequately anesthetized? Check the depth of the patient. If the patient's blinking at you and swallowing, tachycardia might be because it's too light. Maybe. Not always. Maybe. Um, drugs. What drugs did you give? Did you give ketamine as an induction agent? Because I'll tell you, if you gave ketamine as an induction agent, I expect to see tachycardia initially. Um, did you give it another sympathomimetic? So sympathomimetics are drugs that increase sympathetic tone. Did you give it a dose of dopamine? Did you give it ephedrine? Was there something else that you gave? Did you just give it a dose of anticholinergic? Because obviously that can cause tachycardic. Tachycardia. Things like hypercarbia, so high CO2. Hypoxia will initially cause tachycardia, followed by a bradycardia. Um, primary cardiac disease, hyperthyroidism, hyperthermia, and then an adrenal tumor, like a cortisol or a catecholamine secreting adrenal tumor would be the other one. So basically, we go through and rule out all these, and then we manage appropriately and sort of address those issues. Um, rarely, 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 maybe again, like this many times on my hand, I've had to treat with a, a specific drug to bring down the heart rate. And the drug that I would typically use is uh, um, Esmolol or something um, to bring down heart rate. I've really never had to do that. Um, it's exceptionally rare. Usually you can find the underlying cause, treat it, manage it, and everything's good. Um, and, and other things I have done, like in this dog that had this tachycardia that we sort of suspected was primary secondary to some cardiac event, we did vagal uh, massage on the dog and psh, the heart rate came down. We broke the, the ventricular tachycardia and then we could see that it was having atrial fibrillation and, and then we knew what the, the problem was. So there's things you could do. There are other arrhythmias that we see from time to time and I can't really go into all of them. Um, they can be secondary to all kinds of things. It's not always just heart disease. Um, one of the things we see very commonly during anesthesia is the occasional VPC in totally otherwise normal healthy dogs. It's usually not anything to be that concerned about but we'll see them occasionally. In fact, I have VPCs occasionally and I think I'm relatively normal. Um, let me just go back one slide here. Um, electrolyte abnormalities are probably another one where we see some funny arrhythmias associated with it. Uh, secondary heart block, again, you guys all know what secondary heart block is, I assume. So it's a P wave with no QRS complex. So you get an atrial contraction followed by no ventricular contraction. Um, fairly common. And again, we treat it with an anticholinergic. And again, if you, your anticholinergic can in itself initiate a secondary heart block occasionally, uh, which is not that fun. Premature ventricular tra contractions, I've already, recommend, I've already suggested that we do see them from time to time. If I see this many, I'm not really that worried. If I see this many, I get a little bit more concerned and try and manage it, okay? And usually it's lidocaine or something like that or looking for underlying causes. Okay, hypoventilation is another uh, situation that we can run into. So that was all I'm going to say about the cardiovascular system. Hypoventilation, it's kind of difficult actually to diagnose it without a capnograph or blood gas because if you just look at respiratory rate, you cannot tell me whether your patient is truly hypoventilating or not, and I'll tell you why. You can get some indication, but it's hard just to do it from respiratory rate alone.